Are we ready for total excitement? This will finish out this chapter. This does not cover every selected problem. I have left a few for you. Um, and maybe we'll talk about them when we have live Zoom. But last topic here are intangibles. By their nature, there's something that I can't touch. They have no physical substance. But usually I have a, a legal agreement that says I own them, right? So what comes to mind probably for you are patents, copyrights, but there's other things as well. We've got trademarks, we've got franchise agreements, we've got royalty and licensing agreements, And then we have goodwill. These truly are self-wasting assets. They're great. So we depreciate, they all last more than one year, so I'm going to use them up as time goes on. Um, as I use them up, I've got to expense them. When it came to property, plant, and equipment, I depreciated them. When it comes to natural resources, I depleted them. When it comes to intangible assets, we amortize them. But they're all the same word. So in general, just to look at one, let's say I purchase a patent from someone else on January 1, year 1. And let's assume this patent cost me $15,000 and I paid cash. So someone else went to the trouble to register this patent. Patents are good for 20 years. And when I buy this patent from somebody else, I don't get another 20 years. I only get the number of years remaining. So legal life is 20 years, but I can only use it right for how many years are left. So when I get this patent, I ask myself, well, what is the legal life associated with it? And let's say that it's five years. And then I ask myself, can I use this? Will this benefit me for five years? And let's assume it won't. Let's assume that the useful life that I plan on using it for is three years. And I plan on selling it to somebody else after that for the remaining two. When I compare legal life to how long I'll use it, we a lot of times come up with two numbers. You take the smallest to be your useful life. So in this case, we will use three years to be the useful life. Amortization is straight line. So when I go to amortize this, all right, I will take cost minus salvage value, although a lot of times intangibles don't have a salvage value, over the smallest useful life, right, the small one, whichever one that might be. So this costs 15,000. Let's assume it has no salvage value. In fact, if I don't give you a salvage value, you assume that there is none, and then we're going to use the three-year useful life, and I'm going to amortize this patent 5,000 a year. So at December 31st, year one, I will debit amortization expense, credit patent, right, because it is self-wasting, $5,000. Originally, I put this on the books at 15000 And in the first year, I credited it 5000 But I'm going to make the same entry for years 1, 2, and 3. So notice that at the end of the life, it is self-wasted. It's gone away. So if these intangibles have a useful life right, that is not considered to be indefinite, then we will amortize them. And we will amortize them over the smaller of how long I plan to use it and the legal life left. But two in this list over here do not have a finite life. They have an, an indefinite life. And that is usually goodwill and trademark. 
So if I can renew the trademark, and I always have first rights on that trademark, so that nobody's going to take the Nike swatch from me, and I'm Nike, and I know I can renew it every 10 years, then for me, I never use it all the way up. I'm, I've got it to, from now until forever. And so if it lasts forever, like land that we don't depreciate, I will not amortize trademarks. I will also not amortize goodwill because it also is expected to last forever. So you ask, what's goodwill? I cannot make my own goodwill, at least I can, but not the kind I can put on the books. The only way I can put goodwill on my books is if I buy it. So let's assume that my goal in life is to own an ice cream shop on and my little apartment on top of that ice cream shop right on the beach. And one day I finally find the dream ice cream shop with the way cool apartment right on the beach, what I've always wanted. And I call in the two best appraisers in town and I say, go in that, that ice cream shop. Look at every piece of equipment they have. Look at the whole house. Consider the location on the beach. Taste the ice cream. Whatever it takes, appraise that business at fair market value for me. And I've hired the two best in the world, actually. And they come back and they tell me, $1 million. That's the street value, the fair market value of everything in that business. If you took it apart and sold the oven and the freezer and everything in it, you could get a fair market value, you know, $1 million. So I think about it and I say, okay. So I go to the owner the next day and I say, I've always wanted an ice cream shop and an apartment on the beach. Yours is perfect. So when you sell it to me, I had appraisers come in and they said that this building and everything in it is worth a million dollars, fair market value. And the owner just laughs at me and says, I've had offers double that I've turned down. And I'm shocked. I want this ice cream shop. So I go home and I think about it and I come back tomorrow because I don't have two million dollars, but, but I offer 1.5 million dollars and the owner says, I want 2.5 million. And I go home and I think, do I have 2.5 million? What could I leverage for 2.5 million? But sooner or later I ask all my friends and they all agree it's the best ice cream in town. So everybody loans me some money. I go and I offer the fellow $2.5 million and he accepts. The fair market value, street value of everything in there is only a million dollars. Yet I was willing to pay $2.5 million. So to me, there must have been some intangible asset, something I can't put my fingers on, something that I was willing to pay an extra $1.5 million for. And that is what we call goodwill. When you pay more than the fair market value of all the assets in a business, right, we call that goodwill. And it might be because the employees are amazing. It might be that that city that the place is located is very popular. Who knows? But again, if you are willing to pay that extra $1.5 million, that is goodwill. We put it on the books. We do not amortize it because we assume it lasts forever. We do need to check it for impairment, though, every year. But impairment is a subject for another accounting class. So we will not amortize goodwill. We will not amortize trademarks. But we will amortize all the rest over the, either their legal life or useful life, whichever is shorter. One last thing I do need to tell us. A lot of these are created through some type of contract, legal contract. And if for some reason I am brought to court or I bring someone to court for infringement of my patent or I am being told I am infringing someone else's patent, right? And there is a court battle over a copyright, a trademark, whatever, a patent, then if I go to court and I am successful, then my patent or copyright or trademark must still be good and I can leave it on the books. But if I lose, then my patent, which was supported by at one point a legal agreement, which the court has now just told me is not valid, if I lose the case, then I have to take the intangible asset, whichever one it is, off of my books. 
If it's a licensing agreement, if it's a patent, if it's a copyright, and at that point, then I write off whatever is left. Because remember, it's self-wasting. So however much is left in there, at that point, I have to waste it out completely. Okay. So, but if I'm successful, I can leave the asset on the books, but then all the legal fees that I paid for it, I can add to the asset, and then at that point, I will amortize those legal fees going forward. In addition to the regular amortization that I would have taken. So let's look at our last problem. It says on January 1st, Vaughn Company had a balance of $360,000 in its Goodwill account that resulted from the purchase of a small business the prior year. The Goodwill was thought to have an indefinite life, therefore we're not amortizing it. During this year, the company had the following additional transactions related to intangible assets. And it says on January 1st, we purchased a patent with a five-year useful life for $280,000. In the end, it's going to ask us to journalize all of these transactions and then calculate amortization. So during this year, which is 2017, on January 1, I purchased a patent. I debited patent, credited cash, $280,000. They are telling me this patent has a five year useful life. It mentioned nothing of salvage value, so I assume that there is none. On July 1st, I acquired a nine year franchise, expiration date July 1st, 2026, for five. 140,000. What they're trying to tell us by the expiration date nine years from now is that this franchise started immediately. So I will debit my franchise agreement. Then I will credit cash for the 540,000. And this is nine year line. Now, Gap has told us that there are a few things which we can never ever consider an intangible asset. In fact, in the past we did. We used to think of these things and book them as intangibles, but at some point they were challenged and Gap took them back. One of these is advertising campaigns. People thought that if they spent a lot on an advertising campaign and the jingle was that good and they thought people would remember it for years and that that would make people buy the asset, buy whatever the product was, that they should spread the cost of that advertising campaign over the number of years they thought that it would be able to play on the radio or on the television. And so that they would put it up as an asset and then amortize it over the life of this advertising campaign. But at some point, Gap said, mm, no, can't do that. And so now we are required to expense all advertising campaigns. The other thing that they, we used to put up and now we can't anymore, we have to expense as incurred is research and development. Because if we think about it, and we're a big pharmaceutical company and we're spending millions and millions and millions and billions of dollars for the cure for cancer, all those dollars that I spend and then I don't find the cure yet, and I may one day, but I'm putting this up as an asset. An asset is something I own that has value. And if I haven't quite discovered the cure yet, then I have no value. So we're told that we have to expense all the R&D. This, this differs a little bit from international financial reporting standards, which says I have to expense the research, but they let me amortize the development. But here in the US, we expense both the research and development. So when I look at September 1st, it says we spent $185,000 for research and development costs. At that time, I would debit R&D expense because we have to expense it for the amount that I spent. This includes any assets I use in my research. So if I've decided I want to see how fast an airplane can burn, and I take it up in the air and I crash it to the ground and it's a $5 million plane, I include the cost of that plane plus all the equipment that I use to see how fast it burns as well as all the labor that I use to see how fast it burns and how much I put it up in the air 
all those things become R&D costs and must be expensed. So it tells us, prepare the journal entries necessary for the above transactions and then record amortization at year end. And then calculate the value of all of our intangibles. So we've already expensed this, but when I get here to December 31st, I need the adjusting entry for amortization expense. This is already gone, but at some point I need to self-waste part of this patent and this franchise agreement. So let's think about the patent. It is a $280,000 patent. It has a useful life of five years, and I've held it for an entire year by the time I get to the end of December. So it looks like I'm gonna amortize this patent, $56,000. The franchise agreement is a nine-year agreement. So let's think about this. If I take $540,000 and divide by nine years, this would be $60,000 a year if I had held it for a full year. But notice that we purchased this franchise agreement on July 1st, which is right in the middle of the year. So from July 1st to December 31st is six months, which is half a year. So I would make this $30,000, giving us amortization expense of $86,000. So the question says, well, at the end of the year, what do I have in intangibles? Good question. First of all, let's look at our T accounts real quick. I still have Goodwill from last year, right? And they told me the balance in that account was 360. They also told me that it was forever. Therefore, I didn't amortize any part of it. So it's still in our books. I purchased patent later, 280,000. And then I credited patent here, which I'm standing in front of, but you know, my daddy was a black spanker. You should see through me. Um, 56,000. So I took the 280 minus the 56,000. I'm going to have $224,000 of a patent left. Looking at franchise, we put this on our books at 540,000. I just finished amortizing at 30,000. We have a balance of 510,000. And then of course, R&D is not an intangible. So it asks us, how much do we have on our books as intangible at the end of the year? So I would have taken the 360, the 224,000, and the 510,000, and I would have added all of these together. Which would give me 1,094,000 at the end of 2017. Now, I feel like that typically there's a problem that's much more in depth than this, but I don't see it here. Because there's one where we have like, patent and there's legal fees and we buy another patent. I don't know what that problem is, but I'll look for it later on. In the meantime, that's intangibles. And we are done with this chapter. There's only a few problems we didn't do. Oh, and those we'll talk about orally, just the cost of assets and um, what we put them on our books for. Ah, oh, and lump sum. Oh, we're gonna do a lump sum in just a minute. So actually I'll put this on Canvas earlier. So this really is your last video if you're watching them in order. See you later.